Week two of the college football season has been complete. And now it is overreaction Monday from every team around the SEC. Some big storylines. Who could be fired? Whose seat is heating up? And is there concern for any team around the SEC? I've got three in particular that their fan base should be worried about. What's going on, ladies and gentlemen? I am Lucas Hill here of SEC Unfiltered. Make sure you like, subscribe, share, and turn on the bell notifications so that you are notified for every time we post a new video here on SEC Unfiltered. Also, check out secunfiltered.com for more articles and also the podcast version of this episode. Leave us a five-star review if you like us. Leave a one-star if you don't like us. Your feedback is greatly appreciated. And check out some of the best articles from the best staff, from the best SEC entity on the internet. Check out our good friends over at Prize Picks. Go on over to prizepicks.com or download the Prize Picks app on your Apple or Android device. And use code SECU at initial sign up to get $50 instantly when you play your first $5 or more lineup. When you play that first $5 more in a lineup, $50 $50 in free bets. Just use that code S E C U. Overreaction week that's finally here yet again for the second week in a row. We'll be doing this every week throughout the college football season, reacting to every SEC team. And what was the biggest overreaction from the week? The biggest overreaction going into the game for the Florida Gators. Let's start off with them. Going into Sanford, there was no line, but I thought it was going to be closer than what people believed. And I wasn't sure what DJ Lagway would do. Many people were thinking that if DJ Lagway had a big game, then Graham Mertz may get pulled. And so far, 18 of 25 for 456 and three scores is a heck of a way to start it off. Not to mention five carries for 16 yards. And a way to put up 632 against a team that you went into a dogfight with last year, that's mighty impressive. Yeah, if if I'm the Gators, I'm really impressed with how this team performed. Now here comes the first big test. Graham Mertz is obviously going to start this upcoming Saturday. He should be good, and he should be ready to go by the time we get to this Saturday against the Aggies of Texas A&M. Yeah, remember, Texas A&M is the four-point favorite. This will be a heck of a matchup between two quarterbacks that are struggling right now in Graham Mertz and, of course, Connor Weigman. Who's going to come out on top? The biggest overreaction is that DJ Lagway is going to take over Graham Mertz's spot. I don't disagree with that whatsoever because Graham Mertz did not prove a whole lot against a decent Miami defense. You're going up against a much better defense, by the way, in Texas A&M. Their front four is going to get after your butt. They did fairly well against Riley Leonard and Notre Dame, and they did very well against McNeese. Now, don't get me wrong. I know it's McNeese. I know it's not nothing to really show for. I know it's not a lot to put on film. But you look at that week one against Notre Dame, and they really shut down the pass game. They shut down Riley Riley Leonard's ability to throw the football. They did fairly well in containing him as well. So we'll see what happens with this upcoming week. If Mertz gets off to a slow start, if I'm Billy Napier, I'm dropping him and letting DJ Lagway take the reins because it's time for a change pretty soon, and it might just be the change that saves his job as well. Going on over to the Auburn Tigers, coming off of a disappointing 21-14 loss to Cal. Wow. I did not expect this. I will say, Auburn's run defense was fantastic against Jade and I. He finishes with 10 carries for 11 yards. But where did they get beat? Turnovers. The biggest overreaction, especially going into this year, is that Peyton Thorne was not the guy. I thought that with the weapons that they had this upcoming year, I thought it would be better. But Peyton Thorne is not the guy. And you basically proved that. Cal's defense was not that great. They, they, I mean, there's nothing really I could say about Cal's defense that was 
fantastic that really just shocked me, especially when they're coming off of a year like what they had last year. There's nothing really that's impressive about Cal's defense. They forced four picks off of Peyton Thorne. And I'm going to say this, like I said in the offseason. Hugh Freeze made a horrible decision to not go for a transfer quarterback in the portal. You had to get a guy high to back up Peyton Thorne. At least a guy like A.J. Swan. But instead, you get a guy like Thorne, and so far it's backfiring on you. I'm surprised you got away from the run game, too. Jarquez Hunter had 12 carries for 68 yards. Why is he not getting 20 touches? Why is he not getting the football a lot more? Why not go to your bread and butter and give Jarquez Hunter, who should be a top five running back in the SEC, and give him the football? Instead, you're going to the air a lot more. It's supposed to be a balanced attack, but you're putting Peyton Thorne in the situations where you don't want to get him in. And that's what ends up costing Auburn at the end of the day. Going on in Mississippi State, we knew that this defense was going to have problems. Well, all of a sudden, here come the wheels that are about to fall off. Look, I, I'll give it to Mississippi State. They had a heck of a comeback. They're down 27-3 at the half. They come back and make it a one-possession game, but they can't finish the job. They really did. They did better than you thought. The pass defense was awesome. 10 of 20 for Sam Levitt, 69 yards. But you gave up 262 to Cameron Scadabo. Cam Scadabo had a great game. I mean, that was an offensive line of Arizona State that was god-awful. And Scadabo really just took over that game. He had a great game against that Mississippi State defense, who everybody knew that was going to be a problem going into this year. You knew that Jeff Levy's offense was going to take over. You knew that they were going to have great numbers. You knew Blake Shapin was going to take over. He gets sacked a couple times, and it doesn't help that their run defense doesn't do anything. Kevin Coleman's a legitimate great receiver. SWAC freshman of the year last year at Jackson State then comes on over to Mississippi State, and he's starting to make his name now. Kelly Akari, where are you at, dude? One reception for 18 yards. Let's. Why not? Why are we not targeting him more? We got to get more touches to guys like that. We got to get the football to your playmakers. We got to be better, especially on the defensive side of the ball. We knew that Mississippi State was going to have issues, but your run defense has to improve. There's no excuse for giving up almost 300 yards to one guy. One guy. Inexcusable. And really, this is a game that I think Mississippi State could have had. But they got themselves dug into a hole. They get Toledo this week. Next two weeks from now, it's D-Day going up against Florida. See where this team is right now and see where they are going up against a watered-down run, run team. We'll see how Mississippi State – it's going to be a shootout, to be honest with you, between Florida and Mississippi State in two weeks. Because I don't think that either defense is going to have a lot of success. And this could – the over if the over-under is not in the 60s by the start of this game, I'm going to be shocked. Moving on to Texas A&M. We knew that – we thought Connor Weigman was going to be one of the most underrated quarterbacks in the SEC. Well, so far, he hasn't really brought up much. But you're starting to see him get a bit more comfortable. Weigman ended up doing fairly well, 11 of 14, buck 25 and two scores. I mean, he didn't really throw the rock as much as you would have liked him to because Le'Veon Moss and Amari Daniels had great games. One of the best athletes in the nation in Terry Bussey, great game. Great game. Had a reverse that went for 65 yards. So you're, you you needed to get a guy like that, the football, and get him rolling. Weidman took off a little bit. I told you he could do it with his legs. And he did that. He did that a lot against this McNeese State defense. And look, I've seen McNeese State's defense. They're really not as bad as you think. I know they're in the FCS and all, but they've got some studs on defense. Their linebacker, Mike Davey, the son of former LSU quarterback Rohan Davey, what is a Buck Buchanan Award finalist this year? He will be. 
I think he was a B- Buchanan Award finalist last year as well. And I think he might have won it. I don't think he did, though. But regardless, I mean, you got to get Connor Weigman into a groove. You got to let him take shots down the field, and you got to get him comfortable in this offense. Look, Mike Elko's got a lot to work on. Colin Klein's going to have a lot to work on with Connor Weigman. You got to get this young guy ready because conference, because you got a big one coming up when Florida comes to town or when you go to Florida. And that might be the game where you send Billy Napier about one more foot out the door. If his foot isn't already out the door after that abysmal performance against Miami. So if your offense can step up big time against this Florida defense, which you should have much more success over, this is a perfect game for Weidman to pop off. This could be his first 200-plus yard game since last year. You're going to have to get him in that groove, and you're going to have to get it to the foot, get the football to his playmakers. Get the, get more guys like Terry Bussey out on the field. Get more guys like that. Get Amari Clayton the football. Get Le'Veon Moss out of the backfield. Let them work. Let them prove themselves because those are guys that you can trust. I'm telling you, if you get them the football, let them work. You will see a lot of success from them. South Carolina, the biggest overreaction from last week, I said that Shane Beamer would be fired at the end of the year. Now, after what we saw on Saturday, there's still a lot of skepticism about the offense because this was a bad game, both teams uh, offensively. Both finished with a combined total of 435 yards. 435. You're thinking, oh my gosh, this was a low-scoring game. You thought it was going to be. The the over-under of this game was like 40-something, I think. And it did hit the under. But it was a 31-6 South Carolina blowout. and Everybody was like, whoa, hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Let's hold our horses one bit. Are we are 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 we looking at this right? Look, South Carolina's offense is abysmal. There's no there's no question about it. Rocket Sanders needs to get the football a lot more, and this offensive line needs to work, get a lot better. I, and there's no there's no other way around it. Lenore Sellers still took his shots. He still struggled a lot. This was an ugly game. This was very, very sloppy offensively. Defensively, if you are a defensive-minded guy, you love games like this. You love watching guys like that. Look, South Carolina's defense outworked what Kentucky had. If I'm Kentucky, I'd be concerned, and we'll get to the Wildcats in a little bit. Look, I mean – South Carolina's defense is going to be a problem for years to come. This could be a very good uh, Kentucky or South Carolina defense. And guess what? College game day is coming to town this upcoming weekend. We'll be there as well with the SEC unfiltered crew. You better mark my words. You better pay attention to South Carolina's defense because they're going to win them a lot of games this year. If South Carolina ends up as one of the best defenses, don't be shocked. Don't be shocked because you got guys there that can play ball. You got guys that can really, really ball. Evan Stewart or Dylan Stewart's a big time guy. Dylan Stewart's having a great year. He's on his way to possibly an all SEC and an all American type of season. He's probably the best. Edge rusher that I've seen, true pro, pro edge rusher from South Carolina since Jadavion Clowney. I'm not saying this is Jadavion Clowney 2.0 because this is nowhere close to what Jadavion Clowney is. Look, but mark my words, this may be the start of something that could be unbelievable for South Carolina and their defense. Their defense is going to win them a lot of games. Their defense is going to absolutely dominate this year. They're going to struggle, make no mistake about it. They forced a turnover early in the game. But I'm telling you right now, don't be shocked when this defense gets after you. They had five sacks against Brock Vandergriff. 
if that doesn't go up as the season goes on, you're going to have All-American edge rushers and an offense with no identity whatsoever. So that might alone may get South Carolina to a bowl game. But we'll see as the year goes on. Coming up with Arkansas. Now, I talked about Arkansas earlier in my post-game reaction to their loss to the Oklahoma State Cowboys in double overtime. Look, Sam Pittman's days are numbered. There's no doubt. There's no denying it. Taylor Green had a heck of a ball game. A heck of a ball game. Almost 500 yards of total offense by himself. But special teams killed Arkansas. You drove deep down into Oklahoma State territory. You turned the ball over. Big mistakes. Little mistakes like that are going to cost you a football game. There's no way around it. Because what Arkansas proved is that they're going to have one of the best offenses in college football. There's no mistake about that. Taylor Green is a good quarterback. I was skeptical about him before the season. I didn't know what to expect. I didn't think he was going to be that group, that good. And let me just say this. I am sorry, Arkansas Razorbacks fans, about what I said about Taylor Green. I love him. He is a fantastic quarterback. I love his game. I love what he brings to the table. But Sam Pittman's days are numbered. The days are getting slimmer and slimmer and slimmer. And eventually, the day will come, whether it be if Arkansas doesn't. Uh, let me tell, let me just say this: if Arkansas doesn't finish the month of September three and two, Sam Pittman will be fired by the time we get to November. If they can pull off an upset sometime in November, which is very unlikely, Sam Pittman's job will be, oh, Sam Pittman's going to be scratching his unemployed behind by the end of the year. How about the LSU Tigers? Is there cause for concern in Baton Rouge? The run game has been non-existent so far for the, throughout the first two games. You struggled with running back rotation. There's been a lot of issues with that. I don't know if Garrett Nussmeyer has really been given the opportunity to sling the rock down the field. And your run defense? You gave up 145 yards to a guy that, I'm not going to lie to you, Colin Guggenheim played a hell of a game. Colin Guggenheim is a heck of a running back. I've, I've personally watched him play when he was at John Curtis and playing quarterback and, ru and running back in that option and playing the beer. I mean, this dude is a powerful running back. It's hard to go up against a guy like that. But, I mean, you really got beat in the running game. And it looked like LSU's defense just had no answer for them. And literally, a week after you have arguably one of your best performances so far that we haven't seen from LSU in quite a while, a team that literally got after dudes and and cons got consistent pressure. Where was that? Where was that at? I get this was a run-first offense, but where was the line pressure? Will Campbell and Emory Jones and this entire LSU offensive line, there's a cause for concern. I had them as one of the best offensive lines in the nation. Well, they haven't really played like it so far. Tennessee's got a much better offensive line. Texas has a much better offensive line. I would argue even and say Alabama's got a better offensive line. You're struggling right now. You're you're in a bind. Offensively, you got to get everything together. You got to get your stuff together on that offensive line. You can't get your stuff pushed in on the run game. You have to be able to trust Garrett Nussmeyer and take a shot down the field. This is year one without Jaden Daniels. It's time to get real, and it's time to get serious with this team because you got a big one coming up where South Carolina's defense is going to get after you. If you are non-existent in the run game, look, 
That's that's going to be a problem. You're going to struggle. You're not going to be able to do anything running the football. We got to stop running power inside. We got to get the, stretch the football out. We got to get it behind a first round draft pick in an offensive tackle. You got two of them. Why don't you just use that? And if not, then have your tight end pull out and kick out a backer or kick out a nickel. It doesn't matter. Just stretch the football out and get your football to your playmakers. I'm telling you, I, I, it, it makes me sick just looking at this team. I have no ill will towards what LSU is doing, but they'll be in for a reality check if they don't get the what they're going through right now on that offensive line come this upcoming Saturday when South Carolina's young front four is going to punch them right in the mouth if that is the case. Going to the Kentucky Wildcats. Boy, did Brock Vandergriff had a rough night. Three of, thir- three of 10, 30 yards and a pick. Holy cow. He got pressured all night long. Got sacked five times. His playmakers were nowhere to be seen. Pop Dumas was nowhere to be seen, unfortunately. Maxwell Harrison came on in a blitz and played well. Got a sack and three tackles. It's a guy you love to see. But where was everybody else? Deion Walker played okay, but he wasn't the usual disruptor that everybody thought he was going to be. So far, I mean, Kentucky's defense has been good. But their offense has had a lot of struggle, and you saw it last week against Southern Miss. Brock Vandergriff got off to a horrible start. You knew this defense was going to be good. You knew it was going to be a defensive ball game, and it was sloppy. Offensively, 183 yards of total offense is unacceptable. You average two yards of play, third and three and fourteen on third down, 0 for two on fourth, and you had 11 penalties. 11. But you won the time of possession. But guess what? You look like crap on the offensive side of the ball. How do you average just two yards of care a play? Look, Bush Hampton's in pretty deep waters. So far, first two games, you haven't shown anything. You haven't really shown that you should be an elite offensive coordinator. Unfortunately. That's the unfortunate thing. I I was I thought that Bush Hamden would come in and really elevate this Kentucky offense. Has it happened? And if there's cause for concern in Kentucky, Mark Stoops may be thinking that Bush Hamden may be a one and done. He may be going to look for another offensive coordinator. I would. I haven't seen anything from this offense. Brock Vandergriff has not really shown much. Run game, you need to go back to the run game. You got to stick to the ground. Let them run. Offensive line-wise, you look like crap. You better get it together offensively, or else it's going to be a long season. So, at this point, Kentucky may look like the worst team in the SEC, but we'll see what happens for the rest of the year with South Carolina, with Florida, with Vanderbilt. We're not going to know yet who's going to be the worst team until we really get into SEC play. How about the Vanderbilt Commodores? Now, coming off of that big win against Virginia Tech, how would they respond? We know how they've been recently with FCS opponents. They haven't. We haven't really seen them dominate an FCS opponent until yesterday. Put up 55 on Alcorn. How about that? Had a pick six. Punt return for a touchdown. Diego Pavia didn't put up much stats. You know, I mean, they, he really didn't, honestly. You'd think, oh, Diego Pavia's, I mean, you look at his numbers and it's like, whoa. Pavia's only 10 of 13 for 83. And he got sacked twice, too. And you're thinking, well, what's, what's going on here? Well, they went back to the option. They ran the football really well. 39 carries, 260, and four scores. So you really did well, really well running the football. And I think that's going to be Vanderbilt's strength 
with Nate Johnson and Diego Pavia and D- Cedric Alexander running the option. The RPO game is where Vanderbilt's going to thrive this year. They're going to start 3-0 and next week when they go play Georgia State. And look, Vanderbilt's a really, really good French, a good team this year. That they they should not be taken lightly. Look, I was I was really, really impressed with what I saw from Vanderbilt the first two weeks of the season. They get Missouri in a two weeks, and we'll see and evaluate them effectively against a top tier defense and how they perform. But I'll tell you what, I'll tell you what. If this is my way too early prediction on superlatives as well. If Vanderbilt makes a bowl game, Clark Lee is the SEC coach of the year. Guarantee you. They win six games, Clark Lee would win coach of the year. And hear hear me out. Here's why. Look at what they did in the offseason. You acquire an underrated quarterback like Diego Pavia. You get a guy like Tim Beck, who is an excellent offensive coordinator, for the last 10, 15 years in the coaching ranks, who's been working his way up and is getting his job chance in the SEC. And he's really taking advantage of the opportunity. And he's really doing a great job of it. He's he's molding Diego Pavia into what could be one of the most underrated quarterbacks in the SEC. And he could be an all-SEC selection by year's end. Let's go to the Oklahoma Sooners. Oklahoma's been struggling. I mean... There's not a lot that I could say. The last two games combined, this one and last week against Temple, you're a combined 5 of 27 on third down. That is unacceptable. The interior has struggled. You had only 75 yards on the ground. Jackson Arnold didn't show much through the air. He did get it to Deion Burks a good bit. Bauer Sharp had a reception. Javante Barnes played some. Jake Roberts, Brennan Thompson. You've been dealing with some injuries, and really the defense is going to have to carry for a good bit until we get to the Tennessee game in two weeks. But look, this upcoming matchup with Tulane, it's not to be taken lightly. Tulane just took it to Kansas State last week and should have pulled off the upset. So if I'm Oklahoma, I'm not taking a day, a week off and just say, oh, screw this team. We're going to move on to what we got in Tennessee. You don't play down to your opponent. Tulane has proven over the last two years that they are a legitimate force in the group from the group of five conferences. They can play. They're really, really efficient. They can upset you at any day of the week. And look, I have high, high hopes that Oklahoma can turn it around in the interior of that offensive line but they have continued to struggle. You barely got past the Houston team that really kept it close with you all day. Houston's defense played excellent. Excellent uh, on the defensive side of the ball. If they had got their run game going, you probably could say that Houston could have pulled off the upset. But unfortunately, that didn't help. So... There's no telling what's going to happen with this Oklahoma team. I'm hoping they pull it together. From a team that had 249 yards of total offense, that's not looking good right now. I would think that LSU should be above where Oklahoma is right now just because of overall how they perform. It's been inconsistent for both teams, but I think LSU would have the upper hand. But there's a there's there's a lot to be concerned in Norman, LSU, Kentucky, Florida. I mean, a lot of different fan bases should be worried for the next few weeks. Going to the Missouri Tigers, look dominant again. I mean, there's again shutting out an opponent hasn't allowed a touchdown since November 24th when they allowed 14 to Arkansas. So that's saying something. Now I know it was against. A depleted Ohio State team with no Marvin Harrison or uh, Will Howard. Or no, not Will. Yeah, with no Will Howard. And you're on your third string quarterback as well. They shut out Murray State last week. They shut out Buffalo again this week. Look, 
I um, Oklahoma, Missouri is, needs to be feared, but they got to face a very efficient Boston College option game. It's going to be fun to watch. I do think Missouri comes out on top, but we'll see what Boston College defense can do against this team. This will be their first ranked matchup they've had since the bowl game last year. I think Bill O'Brien's going to come out swinging very soon. I think they're going to have a fun one game too. I think that this is a really, really good team. I think Boston College and Missouri may be the most underrated game of the week this upcoming weekend. I think it's one that people need to talk about a lot more and people are going to see, really see take off and really see how this Boston College defense fares against the explosive offense that Missouri comes in. Do I think that Boston College will pull off the upset? Absolutely not. I think Missouri is going to come in and really maul this boss, this Eagles team. And I think they're going to bring them back to reality. But it will be closer than what people think. So expect a good game come this upcoming Saturday. Ole Miss. Jackson Dart needs to be talked about for the high spin. Jackson Dart's having a heck of a two games. Now, I know he won't pl play an SEC opponent until I think the second or the uh, last game of September when they play Kentucky. They get Wake Forest this upcoming Saturday, and they play Georgia Southern the week after. They don't play a legitimate defense until South Carolina on October 5th. But let me say this. This dude looks good. Six scores to zero interceptions, 87% completion rate, 795. He's on pace to breaking last year's passing total. I do think he's going to get over 4,000 yards. In our preseason predictions, according to prize picks, they have him at like 3,250, I want to say. Yeah, he's going to easily overtake that. He may get halfway there by the time we get to the South Carolina game on October 5th. He may be just over that as well. But I think Jackson Dart needs to be talked about a lot more for the Heisman Trophy. This dude's going to have a hell of a season. And if people don't start paying attention to number two and the swagger that he brings for the Ole Miss Rebels, you better be praying that he doesn't pop off on you because they're going to break because they're in for a big-time year. They're in for possibly one of the best seasons they've had in recent memory. They could be in for a deep run in the college football playoff as well. Alabama, should there be cause for concern for the Tide? Now, they did come out with a 42-16 win. Everybody looks at that and says, oh, looks like a blowout. Much, looks like they much better. Looks like they performed much better than they did last year when it was 13-3. Not really. <laughs> not, no, not really. Look, it was sloppy. Very, very sloppy. Alabama had 13 penalties. They're 5 of 13 on third down. They had only 393 yards of total offense, 199 through the air. Look, their defense stepped up when it needed most, and they got the win. But they gave up a hunt, over 200 yards of total offense by Byron Brown. Byron Brown about nearly beat Alabama by himself. But if Jam Miller doesn't have a big game where he go, goes off for 140, and if Jalen Milrow doesn't get shut down majority of the game, look, South Florida may pull off the upset and keep it closer than it what the box score said. Because this was really, really tight going into the fourth. I think South Florida was up 16-14 to 14 going into the fourth quarter. This was a tight ball game. And this was a team that Alabama should not have kept close. Look, this, this was going to be a fun game. Everybody knew it. Everybody knew what was going to happen. Everybody knew that this was going to be a lot closer than what people thought. And USF came to play. USF always comes to play when they play Alabama. But let me tell you, if it's not for that fourth quarter, and if it's not for the last 10 minutes of the game, Alabama looks at this and says, oh, crap. We really let, a, again, have a bad letdown against a team that we really should be dominating on a daily basis at home, too. Now, they managed to cover the spread. There's no doubt about that. They 
got they saved a lot of guys from getting their ankles chopped off by the bookkeeper and the loan sharks as well. But you're, if you're Kalen DeBoer, you're looking at this and saying this is unacceptable. Yeah, we may have won, but we played like crap. You got to be better offensively. You got to be able to convert on third down. Because you're going up against a Wisconsin defense that's going to be much better on the defensive line-wise. Alabama's offensive line played horribly. I mean, they played horribly. Saban would have ripped this team to shreds. But luckily, they got Kalen DeBoer, so they're not going to get ripped too, too horribly as what Saban would. Look, Caden Proctor's been hurt. Tyler Booker, who usually starts at guard, he started outside. Kind of struggled a good bit at five holes on Saturday. They had a illegal block in the back. They got to be more disciplined on the offensive line. And it's going to really benefit them at the end of the day if they can get Jam Miller and Jalen Milrow out in the open space. And if they can improve as the year goes on, they'll be, they'll be okay. But you got to get this offensive line situation sorted out ASAP. The Tennessee Volunteers may be one of the best SEC teams in all of the SEC. It's not just that they're one of the best. They're they're in prime contention to say that we're the best team in the SEC. Look, was it was it good on both sides? Offensively, Tennessee dominated. Did they dominate how they should? Yes. 41 point blowout against a top 25 team and against a good Dave Doran defense. Look, I thought it was going to be close going into the fourth quarter. I was dead wrong. It was 23 at halftime, and then I think it was like 41 10 going into the fourth quarter. I'm sorry, 37 10 going into the fourth quarter. But I mean, come on. Tennessee just proved to themselves and the entire college football landscape that they are the best team in the the second best team in the SEC for now until Georgia plays another big time opponent until they play somebody else until these two meet on November 16th I do think Tennessee right now could be is the second best team in the SEC let me rephrase that by the way George is still number one. I do think Texas is number three. George is number two. Or uh, Tennessee is number two. That's what I mean. So for everybody who's about to freak out, don't worry. I'm not I'm not saying that Georgia is not as good. Georgia is still the best team in the SEC. Tennessee's proven themselves to be one of, maybe, in contention for the best. So, look, Nico Iamaialava still had his th- flaws through two picks that I think one led to a score. But this defense really just smothered Grayson McCall. Held them to 103 yards. You can't ask for anything better than what you saw. James Pierce really wasn't a big factor throughout the game. Uh, Surprisingly, I mean, he didn't really do a whole lot. But look, this team got after him. Had three sacks and I think forced a good bit of turnovers off of North Carolina State. Dylan Sampson went off for 132 and two scores. And look, just because Nico had trouble through the air, did well with his wheels, eight carries, 65, and a touchdown. There's still a lot to work on for Tennessee's offense. They get a good slate versus Kent State before they start SEC play against Oklahoma. So we'll see what happens with them there. But right now, I think Tennessee is the second best team in the SEC right now. Now going on to the best team in the SEC, the Georgia Bulldogs. Look, Carson Beck's probably going to be the front runner for the Heisman Trophy. Um, I know I talked about uh, Jackson Dart being a Heisman Trophy contender. He should be in New York by the end of the year. But the SEC is going to have a good bit of guys that are in New York. If uh, Look, Carson Beck had a great game yet again. Trevor Etienne comes back after the suspension. Goes off for five carries and 78 yards. Doesn't play anymore after that game. They rotate backs. They get a lot of guys in, get a lot of good reps. You see a lot of guys that could show out. 
Nate Frazier still had a great game. Branson Robinson and played well. Chauncey Bowens had some carries. The receiving room still did fairly well. Oscar Delp had a reception. Colby Young was good. Dominic Lovett, Dylan Bell, Arian Smith all played well. You can't ask for anything more other than that. So kudos to what this Georgia offense has done. Uh, the defense-wise, I mean, can't say anything better than what they put out. Look, Georgia's not going to be tested for a while. They get Alabama in two weeks, or I should say three weeks, actually, because they get the the bye, not this upcoming weekend, but the weekend after, and we'll see how they are following the Kentucky game. I do think they come out with a blowout win with that one. What a matchup that would be with Carson Beck reuniting, going up against Brock Vandergriff. That should be a fun little blowout to watch and a nice little interaction at the end of the game. So we'll see what happens with them. And then the Texas Longhorns. Look, Longhorns fans, if you remember my article I wrote about your Longhorns. I know. I know. Look. Texas came out and dominated on all sides of the football against Michigan. This Michigan defense had no answers for what Texas's offense could do. Quinn Ewers finishes with three scores. They get two picks off of Davis Warren. And look, it could be because Michigan doesn't have an answer at quarterback. That could be just the simple reason. And it could be because Michigan's had to replace 13 draft picks. But Texas went into Ann Arbor, and they didn't just win. They dominated against the Michigan Wolverines. They dominated and played awesome against this team. Gunnar Helm had a breakout game. Seven receptions for 98 yards and a score. Isaiah Bond had a couple big receptions, including that huge one in the first half as well. Matthew Golden gets a touchdown. Jaden Blue also coming out of the backfield with a big touchdown. The run game-wise, though, you got to get it more involved. You'll, you'll take the win, but you also have to address your offensive rush game. Jarrett Gibson only averaged three yards a carry. A Trey Wisner also averaging just three. Jaden Blue, who only two yards a carry. So you got to get these guys vertical. You got to get them moving left and right. So these are guys that are really shifty out of the backfield. You got to get them involved more uh, outside of the run, run game. And they did. They did really well. But you also have to establish it. You got to establish the line of scrimmage. I think Texas's offensive line did a fairly good job. But I do think that you got to stretch it out some more. You got to get the run game more more involved, and I think that at the end of the day, it's going to help Texas in the long run if they're better suited when they go play top tier defenses like Georgia, when they play an improving defense in Oklahoma. You know this 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 is and when they go play Texas A and M, this will be fun. I think that this upcoming game is going to be a test to see how does the Longhorn offense perform. Do they get the run game involved a little bit more against UTSA? We're not sure. I'm hoping they do, and I'm expecting that they do, but we'll just see from what Steve Carkeesian has to offer with this run game. But so far, I'm impressed by what I see with this Texas running back room. They're being utilized more as athletes. They're getting hang out of the backfield. They're getting shifty. They're moving left and right. So... The only thing I have to say is that you got to get the run game involved, and we'll see if they can do that this upcoming weekend. What did I miss from Overreaction Monday? Let me know in the comments down below. What is the biggest overreaction from your SEC school? What is the biggest overreaction from your school, respectively? Doesn't matter. We want to hear your thoughts and opinions down in the comments down below. Thank you guys for listening in to yet another great video from us here at SEC and Filter for more. From us here from the best SEC entity on the internet, visit us at secunfilter.com or subscribe and check out more awesome videos from SEC Unfiltered.